Hey, so what we're on the track of, what we're talking about in, the, in class this week and in this video is this idea that perspective matters, that a map or a text that you're reading uh, or a video that you're watching tells you as much about the person who made it as it tells you about the topic or the content that's in it. And um, so what that means is that what is factual or what appears to be factual sometimes is actually just a person's perspective coming through in the text and getting to be familiar with this and always thinking about who the author of the text is, who the designer of the map is, is a really important history skill. So we're talking about maps in class and we talked about uh, the idea that um, some con that there are different numbers of continents, for example. So just to uh, flash this, right? We talked about how some people think that uh, there are seven continents: the North American continent, the South American continent, the African continent, the European continent, the Asian continent, and the Austral Australian continent or Oceania and Antarctica. Uh, but I'll, but some people look at this and say, wait a minute, like that continent is completely surrounded by water almost, right? That continent is completely surrounded by water. I see the water around this continent, but where's the water that separates Europe from Asia? And, you know, there isn't any. There's this little lake here. There's a mountain range here. We talked about different weight reasons why there might be a barrier there. But to be honest, like this is all one piece of, of land. So what separates those two? Our desire to have two names. Yeah, and um, frankly, that can be, uh, that's easily understood as racist, right? Europeans wanted to feel like they were different from Asians and they were on a different continent, so they named seven continents. There are places in the world where you will learn that there are only five continents. America, Antarctica, Africa, Eurasia, and Oceania. And we talked about how even names of things is a political uh, and personal decision. Um, why do we call Oceania Oceania instead of Australia? Because there's this country of Australia, and then there's a whole bunch of other nations, tiny island nations all around it. And they don't appreciate being left out of the continent. So Oceania is a more inclusive term. So the words we use um, matter and um, thinking about that is an issue. So a person who puts Oceania on their map is thinking about one set of things. A person who puts Antarctica on their map is thinking about something else. But then we started talking about the question of size and you guys looked at this map and said, okay, here's the continent of Africa and here's the continent of North America with all that Greenland ice, you know, up there. And honestly, it looks like the continent of North America is bigger than the continent of Africa. That just seems to be a fact. But it then we looked at the actual measurements and it's not true. So how does that get to be? That's where I wanna to start today. So the truth is that our planet is not a flat uh, map like this. Our planet is a ball floating in space. And we know this factually because we have been out there in space now and looked back on it and we can see it. Sometimes when you're in an airplane or you're in the ocean, you can actually look out and see the curvature of the earth, right? So those people who say the earth is flat, they just aren't paying attention because we have figured out that it is in fact a round ball. So if it's a round ball, then how do we get a flat map? It's really tricky actually. So let's just uh, do an experiment. We're gonna do a lab class here in world history. Um, I want to start by thinking about this ball for a second, talking about a couple words. So like we have a planet that's spinning in space. I'm going to move myself front and center here and see how big I can get this picture. That's it, I guess. OK, um, we have a planet that's floating in space and we know that it is rotating. That's how we get the sun coming up and down. Right. And um, so we can describe that rotation. And this is just a fact, right? There is an axis of rotation around which that thing is rotating. And that axis defines the North and the South Pole, which are real things because they mean something about where the Earth is spinning and where it is not. Um, so when you talk about the distance between those two physical phenomenon of the North Poles, you get this thing that we call the equator, an imaginary line, but a real phenomenon, the point at which uh, the point at which the halfway point between the two poles. 
Um, so that's real because there is a halfway point between the two poles, right? And um, then we made more lines on the planet. We said, you know what, it would be convenient to have lines going the other way. Um, and then we drew an arbitrary line. We said, we're just gonna pick a spot and go from one equator to the other. And the spot we picked, of course, was in England because at the time England was kind of like running the world. And so naturally they said, let's pick a spot in our country. The spot they picked for this thing, which is called the prime meridian to go through is a place in, I'm gonna try to point it out to you now, right? A place in England right here. And so that's just totally arbitrary. We just picked it. But anyway, that gets us to this spot where we have uh, an orange with some lines on it. That's just relevant for the next step. So I want to show you now one that I made that has nicer, more even lines because I was paying attention. And I want to think about it. We are trying to make this round flat thing into a, this round ball into a flat map. How do we do that? Y'all feel free to in your own mind, give me advice about the proper way to peel an orange, but I can't hear you. Just sort of shout, scream in your mind, and all the bad things that I am doing here, but what I'm trying to do is get one peel, just for reference. And I really wish I had. All right, there we go. Got the orange out, got the peel. Now I just need to make it flat, right? No problem. And take a piece of paper, darn it. Don't seem to have a blank sheet of paper handy. Gonna take the, uh, there we go. Thank you note for another student. And put it down here. And we just have to you know, flatten it out a little. Okay, there we go. Map of the world, I did it, see, 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 I made a map of the world. Some problems, huh? Like the equator does not go across the middle of the map. Uh, the meridian does not go down the map. And then there's all this empty space. What's that empty space? I mean, it's not on a map, it's all filled up, right? So what are we gonna do? to make this look more like a piece of paper that's all filled up with the world, we could we could stretch it a little. Like we could, we could just kind of color in, oh, that's just some ocean. Just kind of make the lines connect sort of, you know, why not, right? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Is this picture gonna represent, if I add in some stuff, if I stretched it a little bit, if I pushed it around a little bit, is it gonna represent what was really there on that round ball? Of course not. It, there, in fact, think about this, there is actually no way that I could make an accurate flat rectangular map out of a round ball. There's a thousand ways I could peel this and they would all end up not being that flat map and they would all end up being distorted by the time I like stretched, filled, mushed, squished this around, it would all end up being untrue in some way and false in some way because I have stretched it according to uh, whatever method I could think of, yeah? So what happens is that we make these projections is what they're called. We take the round world, we put it flat and we make a projection and we try to come up with a strategy for flattening it. Here's somebody's strategy, see what you think of this one. Looks kind of like an orange, right? but they just left big blank spaces so that you can't even tell that Antarctica is all one continent because they've split it all up here. They did manage to get the equator even all the way across, so that's cool. Um, but there's all this blank space and it just looks weird. So people have done other ways of projecting it. Uh, they have said, let's try this. Uh, so the Mercator projection was made by people who cared a lot about shipping. And they were going around the world in boats and they really wanted to have the lines be straight. So they were concerned about having lines that on the making arbitrary lines that were straight and then being able to know that if they went along this line, they would end up here. They were concerned about that. So what they did was they stretched the planet picture in order to get that result that they cared about. 
the effect of that, and you might notice how the squares have to get so much bigger down here. The effect of the Mercator projection is that they had to stretch more the stuff at the top. Think about this one over here. They had to stretch more the stuff at the top because that's where it's hard to get it to fit together. So the tippy top part of the world here gets bigger than it actually is. And Antarctica looks bigger than it actually is. And as a result, when we compare the continent of Africa to the continent of North America on a Mercator projection, we may think that the North America is bigger than the continent of Africa. And that is actually not true. It's just the way it looks when you make the lines fit. So this is a different projection called the Peters projection. And uh, the Peters projection people had a different idea. They wanted to be really, really careful to make sure that the planets were the right size. And since you can't do that and make all the lines straight, they decided to go ahead and mess with the shape. So this is not the right shape for the continent of Africa as it appears in space on that round ball, but it is the right size. And in reality, the continent of Africa is huge compared to the continent of North America. Uh, also, the continent of South America is bigger than you thought it was. And these uh, uh, islands that make up Indonesia and the Philippines are bigger than you thought they were. Um, and so imagine growing up in a place along the equator here where your world has been artificially made smaller on a map and you've looked your whole life at these maps. How do you feel about your continent? And so the personal, the ideas of Mercator or Peters becomes the political very, very quickly because of all of us growing up imagining the African continent to be much less than it really is. And that has consequences in our in our worldview, right? Um, once you start thinking about this stuff, it gets pretty interesting because you can think about other decisions that the map maker was making. So, for example, what is the middle of the world? The world is a spinning ball. It doesn't have a middle. I mean, the middle, well, it's like inside, right? It's not on the map. So how do you decide what part of the map should be in the middle? This map that you're looking at right now has the continent of Africa, or let's say the Atlantic Ocean in the middle, but you don't have to put it that way. There's no law that says you have to put it that way. Here is a map. This is the map I saw when I went into my first classroom in San Lorenzo, when I started teaching, I pulled down the projector and there it was a map that puts America, the continent, and the United States in particular, the nation, smack dab in the middle of the whole world. I mean, it's true, but it's also not true, right? There is no middle. Uh, but look what happens when you do that. The Asia and Europe do get cut apart. And uh, you can't even tell they're connected just by looking at this map. I mean, you have to think about it. So by making ourselves the center of the world, we um, change everyone's perspective that's looking at this map. Hmm. And um, in, in class, I will have told you a little bit about the name for the real name of China, Zhongguo, which actually literally means the center of the world. Everybody thinks they're in the center of the world. Look around you, you are in the center of the world. Uh, that's not a you know messed up thing to think, it's your reality. But when you put it on a map, and it starts to be a reality that you're projecting onto other people. So you could make different choices about the center. Maybe you put the Pacific Ocean at the center of the map. When you do that, it makes you really think about the Pacific Ocean, doesn't it? Look at this, it's a huge ocean. And look at all these islands, which we almost never pay attention to because on maps that have the continent of Africa, like the one behind me in the center, the Pacific islands get cut off at the edges, and we don't really notice how massive this uh, group of Pacific Islands is. Uh, or just Australia, it becomes kind of like a, an afterthought. But here's this is a cool map if you want to think about it that way and you're interested in that. Here's another question. What's the top? We know that there are North and South Poles, right? But 
who says the North Pole is the one on the top? It's a ball spinning in space. Uh, it could be the South Pole. Maybe the South Pole is the one that is on the top. And you're saying, yeah, but then the words would be upside down on the map. Well, you, you can make the words the other way around, right? So here is a map of the world in which the South Pole, Antarctica, is at the top and the North Pole is at the bottom. What does this make you think about? I'm thinking a lot about Australia again, yeah? It starts to pop up there as like a really important country. If I was living in Australia, this might make me feel pretty good about everything, yeah? And I never really noticed the relationship between Australia and Indonesia quite the way that I'm noticing it now. We get China on top of Russia. Get the United States on top of Canada. We get Brazil and Argentina. Do you think about them as much as you would if you were looking at this map all the time? It's very interesting to think about how the maps that we look at might have affected the way we think about the world. So I got one of these in my room just to keep my head, you know, on the right track, keep me honest. So the point is that the way that the map is presented, the facts are there, the world is what it is, but the way that those facts are presented reveals the bias, the perspective of the person who made the map. And even more than that, it reveals the context, the life, the interest, the concerns in which that map was made. The, the Mercator projection was made in the context of a lot of people trying to travel around the world by boat and needing a map that was friendly to their purposes. That was their context. There's other kinds of ways that context can influence a map. Check this one out. We're going way back now. This is 1300. And this map was made in England. Takes a minute to figure it out. This is the Mediterranean Sea. That is Europe. That is North Africa. This is the Middle East. So first thing is that this map maker didn't really know very much about what was on the outside of those places that they had been. They didn't really know the rest of the continent of Africa. They didn't really know what was out there east. Yeah. And so they only mapped the part of the world that they knew. Another thing you can tell is that they decided to put east on top. North is over here. South is over here. West is on the bottom. Let yesterday, the ninth graders attended an orientation. And that's a very old word, orientation. It uses the word orient, which is now kind of a pejorative term to refer to the East. But in those days, that was the word. The East was orient, and anything Eastern was oriental. And all maps had East at the top for a while. So in the same way that when you get a map, you like turn it around until it has north at the top so you can figure out where you are. People used to turn the map around until they had east at the top so they could figure out where they were. They were used to orienting the map to the orient or the east. This is that map. And that is why we call it an orientation because it's getting you oriented to the east. But whoa, did you just hear like all the embedded race stuff in that word? Whoa. Interesting. So that's the Orient. This map was made a little bit later. And you can see a little bit more. See that it goes all the way over to India. Only uh, Sri Lanka, as usual, is like really big and important and kind of not quite in the right place. Um, this map is being made before people could go out to the space and see what was there. And so they weren't exactly sure how things worked out. Uh, they've been thinking a lot here about the Nile River in North Africa, but they still don't know what's down there, in the rest of Africa. And look at how they put angels on the outside of the map. Do you think they might have been trying to protect themselves, defend themselves against uh, what was out there in the unknown? Who knows? Check out this map. This map is made um, by a Middle Eastern Muslim map maker. 
much earlier actually than the two maps that we just saw. This is the Mediterranean Sea and they've put the Red Sea that goes down past Egypt and into towards Sudan on the map here in a sort of straight way. Can you see how interested this map maker was in all of these little islands? In their world, the movement around in these islands, in these two oceans, was absolutely the most important thing that was going on. And so being careful to know what they all were and where they all were was super important. You can see the map maker taking so much time on that and not so much on other things. In fact, some of the stuff they put out here is just a little bit imaginary. This map was made in China around the same time as that first map pointing east. But here were the people who were actually out there in the east. They're making their map of their own world. And of course, they're at the middle of it because that's the world that they're in. Um, a cool thing about this map is that all these little pieces of paper on here that are uh, little tiny rectangles, they go up and down because mostly uh, the Chinese language is written not across the page like this. Actually, that would be the other way, but up and down. And so the names of all the cities are up and down. Notice how important the rivers are in Chinese life in 1389. It's, the, it's still the most important thing in the world uh, for, for, for China, uh, but it was super important then. And these uh, folks in 1389 in China were exploring a lot. And so you can see Korea is big in their minds and um, some of the other places that they had been. It's 1626 here, and this map maker from Europe has discovered what they called then the New World, the other side of the planet where the Americas were. But you can see that they still haven't quite figured out everything about that. I'm not really sure some stuff up here. They just kind of left out. They've got the whole continent of Africa now, so they have figured out how to, what's all around that a little bit. The islands in the Pacific are super important to them. And look at all these symbols that they've put around, the kind of things that folks who are traveling do to reassure themselves um, but a lot of stuff trying to prove what they understand about the roundness of the world um, so you can see that 1626 folks are struggling to express their new reality their new understanding of uh, what the planet looks like if you think about it a little bit right if a map is just a statement about the map makers priorities and not so much the facts, then isn't it just a work of art? Well, it's a very, very useful work of art if you need it for your travels on a boat, but it is also a work of art. And so some artists sort of picked up on that and said, you know what, how about if I make you a map that shows you what I feel as an artist about the planet that I'm on? This is a Boetti, very famous piece of art. Boetti was interested in what? So, Boetti has put all the flags of the world at that time. So you can see the Russian flag has changed. Um, Boetti has put the flags instead of the, the borders and the cities and the rivers and things like that. This map was so famous that uh, it became uh, something you could buy as a, you know, a rug, uh, a shower curtain. And Boetti made a lot of money uh, selling this map. I'm going to come back to that. Here's uh, a map that was made as a rug in Afghanistan. Uh, the language is Dari. And um, we don't know the name of the author because um, there were many, many rug makers in Afghanistan who were hired by Boetti to make ma uh, map rugs. And they got the idea that in their free time, they would make their own maps, uh, their own map rugs. And so this is uh, some of their work. So we don't know all their names. Uh, look at the time zones that they have put across the top. Pretty cool, huh? Um, just, a, you know, I'm calling this an artwork, but it, it's very functional in a lot of ways. Jasper Johns, feeling about the United States. What do you notice? You ever heard of red states and blue states? 
Jap Jasper Johns has just kind of blown it up here. Yeah. Check out this one. This is uh, Krista Ditchkins uh, making a map of her home country, Peru. Instead of putting cities and rivers, she's put in religious and historical symbols, mixing up Catholicism and the conquistadors with more ancient, ancient and indigenous, indigenous art. She has a lot, she has to, a lot say to say about Peru, about Peru here, here, which does not come does across not come in a regular map. Here. You know, but you wouldn't want to try to use this to find a train station. But it's communicating a lot. Let's see. Last one, I think. Okay. Where are we? Giving you a minute. Do you recognize Huntington Park? Compton? Pasadena? This is LA. LA rethought as the face of a movie star. Because it's LA, right? Matthew Kusick, meditating on the subject of maps. So, just a little effort to, you know, blow your mind, or maybe not. Uh, what your assignment is after this is to just write a little reflection about what you can tell about a map and about the map maker from looking at it carefully and thinking about the bias, thinking about the context, thinking about our planet, thinking about what are the facts and also what are not necessarily facts. So um, looking forward to reading your reflections.